Good morning, Grade Elevens, and uh, I was going to give this to you last week as well, but I thought I, you know, I kind of changed my mind. I thought I'd given you enough last week. So uh, we got a lot to do this week, though. We're going to talk about circuits, and um, you know, we you should have done some of this in Grade Nine, but it's been a while. It's been a couple of years. So let me just refresh your memory uh, before I start getting into um, some of the rules about electric circuits. I want to just show you some of the symbols that we use for electric circuits, okay? Um, all right, number one. Uh, take a look at this. A cell, basically, cells and batteries, okay? So these two things are connected. Short sticks and long sticks, right? And one of the things you have to uh, memorize, well, you have open book tests, so you don't really have to memorize anything these days, but if you were in my class as usual. I would ask students to memorize which end is plus and minus. I remember that for a cell, like a, think of a battery, right? You might put like a nine volt battery or something. There's a positive end that's called the cathode and then the anode is the negative terminal on the battery. So I always remember the negative sign because the short stick looks like a kind of a minus sign turned on its side here in this case, but it's a shorter negative, short, the shorter stick is negative, the longer stick is positive and that's how you draw a battery. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm showing you this because later when I draw circuit diagrams, which is something else you're supposed to know how to do. Um, so when I show circuit diagrams, uh, you'll know what I'm doing. Okay, so uh, sometimes we just have a generator, which is not really a battery. So this DC and AC generator, this little wave symbolizes AC. So any wave like that symbolizes AC, Okay, just so you know. Um, all right, a battery, a bunch of cells connected together form a battery that we that when we connect them in series, which means one after the other, plus minus plus minus plus minus, right? Then that will increase the voltage. So I'm just gonna say this makes a uh, an increased voltage. So the voltages add up. Okay, here you connect them like this. This is a pair, what's called a parallel circuit. Here you connect them to increase current, okay? And I'll explain why that's the case a little bit later, okay? Um, a couple of other things. Uh, basically, a load is a device, okay? Like your phone is a device, right? It's an electric device. Uh, your TV is an electric device. A light bulb is an electric device. Okay. Now some of these things have special symbols all their own. Um, for some of them, um, you can represent any device as a resistor. Okay. So this any device can be drawn this way, whether it's a phone, a toaster, a stove, a kettle, whatever the case may be, we can represent it as just a resistor because basically all devices are basically resistors. Okay. And I'll explain what resistors are later as well. Uh, some devices though <clears throat> have their own special symbol. Okay. So for example, a lamp, uh, you draw a little filament in a lamp like this. Okay. That's a lamp. There's also LEDs, but I'm not going to tell you. Well, if you're really curious, I can show you a LED looks like, like this. Okay, and then you circle it, and then there's some light coming off it here, like a little arrow. Uh, you don't have to know that one, but I just thought I would add it in just for interest's sake. So let's call a light emitting diode or an LED, okay, and I, which are you probably familiar with that term. A coil is just a little, looks like a little coil of wire. A transformer we'll get into later. Motors we'll get into later as well. Okay, uh, meters, this is for current. So we call it an ammeter, and this one is obviously for voltage, okay? And so that's a voltmeter. And then a galvanometer is for really tiny voltages. So it is a voltmeter too, but it's very sensitive, okay? Just so you know. All right, a couple of other things. Um, when wires make a connection, you draw a dot where they meet. So that's called a junction. Okay. So that is a junction where two wires meet. Here, if they don't, sometimes we draw these like this. 
that's terrible. Maybe I'll use a thinner pen. Sometimes you draw them like that, kind of, they hop over the wire. Uh, but you're never going to have to do that anyway, so I wouldn't worry about it too much. Uh, switch. This switch is open, which means there's no electricity flowing through because the path is broken. Here the switch is closed, but you can still see the two terminals just to show you that there's a switch there. Otherwise, it would just look like a straight wire. Okay. Um, a fuse is something that's used to terminate the electricity. If it, there's too much electricity drawn, the fuse will break or blow. Okay. And that will stop the electricity flowing. And when you attach something to the ground, it's called grounding, right? Uh, we use this symbol here for ground. Okay. Anyway, so those these are symbols you need to be familiar with. Uh, you don't need to know this one, so let me cross that out. Let's cross that out. Um, it's not really correct anyway. It's kind of an error in the book. All right. So anyway, there are some symbols for you. Okay. So now moving on. Uh, you should have learned this in grade nine, so I'm just going to go through this quickly. If you're going to build an electric circuit, let's say you want to make a light bulb turn on. What do you need? Well, one, you're going to need a power source. And this will um, allow the electrons. Whoops. to flow in the circuit. In fact, it drives the flow, right? So it provides current voltage. Okay, so it's a source of energy. Okay, number two, uh, you need a path. And the path is made of conducting material, like usually copper, okay, um, in the form, typically, of wires, but of course it doesn't have to be wires. Um, you know, you could have a sheet of aluminum foil that could be your path. So, you know, as long as it's conductive, okay, but anyway. For us, when we're building the circuit, when we're consider, you won't be building the circuits because we're not together. But when we're looking at circuits, it's always wire for us. Okay. And number three, there has to be a load. In other words, there has to be something you're trying to power in the circuit, not just wires and a battery. That that's called a short circuit if there's no load. Okay. So um, a device. that is using the electrical energy. You know, and usually the load, like your phone is a load, right? Like it, it does, it's a device, it does something. It takes the electricity and does many things with it. Okay, it pr produces a radio signal, for example, so you can connect to Wi-Fi, it uh, powers the display. Okay, and make sounds and stuff like that. So your phone is a very, it's like a little miniature computer, right, in your pocket. So a phone is a very complex device for sure, but basically all devices do the same thing. They take one form of energy, in this case electrical energy, and convert it into other forms, whether it's sound or light or whatever the case may be. Okay, all right. So anyway, that is in essence, okay, those three things are required. Now, some people will say, what about a switch? Well, yeah, like, but it's not absolutely required. Some, some devices, you just plug them in, right? And that's it. <clears throat> they don't have a switch. So some devices, you plug them in and they're on. Okay. So a switch isn't absolutely necessary, but it's often included. But, you know, I'm not going to write it down as an absolute minimum. So these are the minimum requirements for any electric circuit would be a power source, a path, and a load, right? And that's it. Okay. Uh, Kirchhoff's laws. So let's talk about some circuits now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what the rules are. Okay. For how voltage and current work in a circuit. Okay. So number one, uh, we're going to start with the current law. Okay. Now this one's pretty easy. 
Um, the rule goes like this, the current flowing into a junction must equal the current oops, flowing out of a junction. Okay, and that's the current law. So the uh, let me show you what I mean by that. Okay, first I'll, I have an example on the side, but like before I get to that example, let me just show you this. Um, let's say you have a junction is a fork in the road. Okay, and let's say you have 10 amps that are flowing in. And what happens is it's a fork in the road. So some current will go straight through the intersection and some are going to turn right. Okay. Now, let's say I tell you that three amps turn right. Well, the question here, we use I for current, remember, is what is that missing current then? And I think you probably guess that it would be seven, right? Well, that's what the law is saying, that your guess is absolutely right. So in other words, this one must equal 10 minus three equals seven amps. So what we're saying is if 10 amps flowed into this junction, so here comes our 10 amps and they flow into that dot, then 10 amps have to be flowing out. You can't have missing current in a junction where like, you know, 10 amps flowed in and only one amp flo flowed out. Well, what would happen to the rest of the current, right? It's gotta go somewhere, okay? It's like, water flowing in a pipe. Like, you know, if there's a fork in the road, you don't have 10 gallons of water flowing into a fork, in, like, you know, a, a junction in the pipe, and then only three gallons flowing out. Like, where'd the rest of that water go? If there's a leak, well, then it leaked out, but it still went somewhere, okay? The leak would be another path, okay? So you have to put that path in the diagram, right? But the water has to go somewhere. It can't just vanish. It's the same thing with this current. Okay, can't just vanish and must flow uh, and must be accounted for when you're drawing a circuit, okay, when you're filling in these numbers in a circuit. Okay, so let's do this example here. Now, the way they typically draw current is conventionally, it flows out of positive, okay, and flows back around, back into the negative. That's actually backwards, but that's called conventional current. We'll talk about that later. Okay, so here's conventional current. And uh, it's coming out of the positive, flowing this way. So here we, here we have 12.5 amps, okay? And then here is our junction, right? Now, what happens is we get 2.5 and 4 that are flowing, 4 flow straight through, okay? So in other words, this one here is 4 amps right there. This path here is 2.5 amps. And the question is, how many... How, many, how much current sort of went over here? Well, it has to be six amps, right? Because six plus four plus 2.5 add up to 12.5. So I had 12.5 amps. You can follow it in. It flowed in there into the junction. And then what happened is, and I'll use some different colors. 2.5 went this way. Four went that way, right? And then I'll use blue. And then uh, six must have gone on that third path. Now here at the top, by the way, so here I have six amps flowing through this branch here in the circuit. So it flows sort of up here and through there like that, through that resistor here and that resistor here. Some students will say, why is it like this? Like, why do they do this? Well, the thing is, is this must be the easiest path. Some, sometimes we say it's the path of least resistance, okay? So let's say, I like using this analogy of going skiing, okay? So let's say you have, you. this is your chairlift here, okay? Your So this power supply, the battery, is your chairlift. And then what happens is, 
this I know this number is not going to make sense, but 12.5 skiers get off the chairlift. Okay, so say for example, like I, I know you can't have 12.5 people, but you know with current it can be like that. Okay, so let's say 12.5 skiers get off a chairlift at the top, and then what happens is they get to a fork in the road here. They all all 12.5 of them take the same path, and then they get to this fork in the road, and there are three different runs down the hill. One's easy, one is medium, and one is hard. Okay, so just by nature, more people will take the easy path. Okay, because there's always more beginners in a group than there are experts. Okay, and so what happens is if you are a beginner skier, there's going to be more of you in the pack. And so more of you will take the easy run. And that's true on a real ski hill. The, the easy runs are always the busiest runs with all the little kids and everything else. Okay, so what's happening is these three paths aren't equal. This resistor, the one on the easy path, has less resistance in it, so more current will go that way. And then the one in the middle here is sort of medium, so there's a little bit less current going there. But this difficult run has the least amount of travelers. That's because it's the hardest one. Now, it doesn't get zero, but it gets a very small, well, relatively small amount compared to the other two. Okay, now at the bottom of the hill, they all meet up. I know it's kind of upside down here, but at the bottom of the hill, they all meet up again. Okay, and that's part of Kirchhoff's laws also, right? That where they meet, the current flowing into this junction here adds up to 12.5, and then they all flow out that way. Okay, so you know, 2.5 plus 4 plus 6 have to add up to 12.5, so 12.5 is going back into the battery. And then they go up again for another ride. Okay, and that's basically how it works. So that's Kirchhoff's current law. All right, let's now talk about Kirchhoff's voltage law. So this is number two. I'm just going to zoom in. Okay, now this one is a little bit harder to write. It goes like this the sum. of the voltage increases on a single path must equal the sum of the decreases in the loads. Okay, now voltage, you have to remember current is flow, but voltage has to do with energy. Okay, so to understand Kirchhoff's voltage law, uh, let's do an example. Okay, so I'm going to draw a little circuit diagram here. Here's my battery. Here's load number one. And I'll draw a little light bulb here. Here's load number two. And then I'll draw a little motor here that is load number three. Okay, so the battery's voltage, I'm going to call VB, this is V1, this light bulb is V2, and then this motor is V3. Okay, now here's the thing. What happens is when electricity passes through, let's say, a resistor, okay, like this resistor here at the top, the voltage drops. Okay, well, that's because the resistor is using some of the energy. Now, the current won't drop because there's only one path for the current, right? So if three amps are flowing into the, uh, to the first load here, then they're going to flow out because like, they, can't, they have nowhere to go. So you don't, you don't ever drop current through a load, but you drop uh, resistance, or sorry, let me say that again, you drop voltage through a load, okay, so the energy does drop, okay, so I'm going to use this, like the ski hill again, and basically it goes like this, okay, energy, remember gravitational potential is like MGH, it's like how high you are on the hill, you know, will determine how much gravitational potential you have, well, when you're skiing down a hill, the chairlift takes you to the top, okay, 
So this here is an increase. It's giving you voltage. These V1, V2, and V3, I'll write it down here, are drops or decreases. Now I like that we use the word drops because it's like dropping down a hill okay, on a ski hill. So the chairlift takes you to the top. That's the battery's job. So the battery is the chairlift, okay? And what it does, so did I use that? Did I, did I say that here? Yeah, so here. So here's your, again, this is your chairlift. It gives you energy, okay? And then these things take that energy away. So let's say the hill has gave you, like you, the chairlift gives you like, you know, as you go up the hill, it gives you 10,000 joules of energy or something, okay? Then what happens is you're gonna lose some of those joules here, then you're gonna lose more here, going down these various drops, okay? But the thing is, is where do you end up? Well, you end up at the bottom of the hill. So what Kirchhoff is saying here is that whatever the battery gives you, you have to lose it before you get back to the battery, okay? In other words, you must be at the bottom of the hill as you come back to the battery with no voltage left in you, okay? So you've lost all the energy the battery gave you along that path, okay? So let's do an example here and I'll show you what I mean. Well, okay, first let me just write down what he's saying here. What he's saying is that the voltage in the battery would equal V1 plus V2 plus V3, right? So these are increases equals the decreases. That's what he's saying in voltage, okay? So this number, you, I like putting a B for battery, 240 volts, okay? So you have your chairlift gives you 240 volts. So this is your battery, okay? And then what happens is, as we go through the circuit, let's go from plus to minus again. So as we, we get off the chairlift here, and then we reach the first drop on our run, and we lose 60 volts, okay? So here, this is a drop of 60 volts, right? So we, it's like, you know, let's say you had $240 in your pocket. Well, you just dropped 60 of those. So now you're down to 180, okay? Now here, we don't know what this one is. That's our goal is to find that number. But we do know by the time you get to the third one, you drop 80, and by that time, you have to have a zero left, okay? So what they're saying is, the way to figure out the missing value is to say 240 is equal to 60 plus V2 plus 80, okay? Now, 60 plus 80 is 140, so that means V2 has to equal 100 volts, okay? And that's Kirchhoff's voltage law. Okay, make sense? All right, now unfortunately the questions aren't exactly this easy, okay? So let me show you how you do sort of a combination problem and I have one example for you here and that'll be it for the lesson for today and then I'll let you get to the homework. Okay, so look, fill in all the blanks, okay? I always tell students, here I'm gonna put in the margin one, Start with current, if you can, okay? So I like to start with current, and in this case, let's follow it through. Okay, so I notice right there, that's four amps. Okay, now I'm gonna circle this with a rainbow. There's a junction here, and there's three amps there, so how much is there? Well, we know that four amps, let me zoom in on this, we know that four amps is flowing out of the junction. So what's this missing current? Well, three plus blank gives us four, so therefore this number must have been one amp. Okay, that is the number one. So we've got one plus three is four, really easy so far, right? Now, here at the bottom, we know that three amps went this way and one amp went that way, Okay, and that's our current flowing into that junction. And so what's this missing current here? Well, it had to be four amps, okay? 
had to be 4 amps because 3 plus 1 is 4. So this junction here, 4 amps are flowing out of it, so 4 amps had to flow into it. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. All right, now, now that we've done the two missing currents, let's do the missing voltages. Okay, so what I'm going to do to do the voltage is you have to follow a path. So I'm going to start here at the battery that's 18 volts. Okay, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow my path. So just watch. I'm going to maybe I'll use a highlighter color. So I'm going to follow this path like this. I go through there. I don't know what that voltage is. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to come up here and now I have a choice to make. Well, I'm going to choose the path that I know. So I'm going to go this way. And the reason why I went this way is because I know what this voltage is. Had I gone the other way, I would have two unknowns. Okay? So follow the yellow path. I go this way. I go that way back to the power supply. And now I'm done. Okay, now I'm going to zoom out. So on the yellow path, so here, the yellow path, remember that the voltage law says that along any single path, so I have to take a single path. I can't take the other path because that would be following two paths at the same time. So I'm going to take one single path and I'm going to choose my path. Okay, there's only one unknown voltage on that path, right? All right, so I choose my, I'm choosing that on purpose. So therefore, 18 will equal V4, which is the fourth load there, plus three. Okay, just follow the yellow line. This one is three here. Okay, now I'm following it, and my V1 is six. Okay, so I get 18 equals V4 plus nine. So that means V4, my missing guy, is 9 volts. So I'm going to just write that in here. This one is 9 volts. Okay, so now I find I found one missing voltage. There's well, only one left, and it's this guy here. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow a different path. Okay, I'm going to make this highlighter a different color and make it blue. Okay, so now I'm going to start here. I'm going to go this way. Okay. And then I'm going to go this way. Take the path I didn't take before and then back to the power supply like that. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about the blue path. And in the blue path, there's only one unknown now. See, I had to take the yellow path first to find my V4. But now that I know what V4 is, I can now find missing V2 by just going like this. It's going to be 9 plus V2 plus. And then that voltage at the top, V1, is 6. Okay, like this. Okay, so um, 9 plus 6 is 15. So V2 will equal 3 volts. Okay. And now we found our missing voltage that voltage there is three volts. All right, so um, hopefully that's good for you. I think I did some of the homework. I have a worksheet on this I'm gonna to give to you later. I just have to talk to you about Ohm's Law first. That's our tomorrow's lesson, and then that's it. So guys, that in a nutshell is how you do Kirchhoff's Law problems. Now, if you look at this problem, it looks kind of complicated, but actually, it's really easy, okay? The math for a grade 11 student, very very easy, very straightforward. So anyway, I hope you find that when you're doing it. Uh, just let me talk to you about the homework and where we are in the homework. Okay, so we just did this lesson right here. Okay, actually we did this part. So I'm not sure where you are in the homework at the moment, but for today, can you please look at these, uh, you know, 10 questions or so. I think there's around 10 questions there. So if you could please look at those, they're really easy. Don't take very long, just a few minutes to do each one. So um, 
yeah, so we'll do this for today. And then tomorrow, we're going to do this and this. So this is what we're doing this week, okay? So I'll erase that for now. But please do, here I'll highlight it in yellow again. Please do this homework. And you should have done all of the rest of this up to now, okay? All right, so that's it for today. And uh, there's going to be more this week, though. That's not very much so far. So I will uh, we'll get to finish the stuff on electric circuits before the end of the week. And then we'll move on to magnetism. And magnetism is really the last thing that we're uh, doing in the course, pretty much. Except for the independent unit, but I'm not sure that if we're going to do that or not. We'll see. We'll see if we have time at the end. We have about five weeks left. Okay, so we might have time. All right, guys. So uh, have a good day, and we'll talk to you soon.